hours of time. We're networking. <laughs> <laughs> Good afternoon. Welcome to the 48th Color Lab Convention in Reno, Nevada. Today is Tuesday, April 23rd, 25th, 2023, and this is the email marketing session. I am Bob Riggs and will serve as the moderator for this session. Our panelist today is Shauna Carey and myself, Bob Riggs. Um, we will ask you to turn off and silence all electronic devices. To assist in future convention planning, we are tracking attendance at all sessions. <coughs> By a show of hands, please identify if you are a caller. All right. And if you are not a caller, We have almost an equal number. All right. Um, so to start off this session, there's several uses of email in our world, and we can use it to communicate with our dancers, we can use it to communicate with our peers, we can use it to communicate to prospective dancers, so there's a wide range of things we use email for. Um, we can use it to promote our, our products, our services, all those kinds of things. Uh, today we're going to talk about two sort of very different areas in the case of email marketing or email usage. And we, we convinced Shauna that she does some really cool things with selling her, her, her products and the other things she does. And so she will speak and I'm going to speak about MailChimp and the way I use it to communicate both to new dancers or prospective dancers and to my club members and, and to a variety of folks. So uh, let me introduce and turn it over to Shauna Carey. Thank you, Bob. You can all hear me back there? Yeah. Okay, did everybody get the handout? It is on the portal. If somebody's listening to it, take the handout. It's on the portal for the email marketing session. So just to kind of build on what Bob said, when they asked me to do this, if I'm being honest, when they asked me to do this, they mentioned MailChimp, and, and I had very little luck with MailChimp. In fact, I went with another source, and I just joked, the chimps don't like me. <laughs> I don't know what I did to the chimps, but the chimps don't like me. So I had to find another purpose. Um, and you know, they tell us very clearly, don't, don't sell stuff from the stage, don't promote your, you know, your products. So I'm not talking about my products, I'm talking about what I use this, um, email marketing for, and that is, of course, is to let people know about new releases for music and other music producers and other people selling things use these mass email um, services to get the word out. Because anymore, we don't have, once a year we get together and it's not even a, you know, it's a very small subsection of our already small market. So whether it's what I'm doing or what, what you're all doing, I'm very anxious to hear once I go through my piece other ways that I can use it at home with my club and, and, and associations and things. So I'm very anxious to hear Bob's side of it. But what I wanted to talk to you first is when you're using these uh, tools like MailChimp, the one I use is ReachMail, and on the flyer, that little picture at the bottom that's you know kind of light, that is, I did a Google search to find out what is available right now, and those were the top ones that came up. And so I just thought I'd highlight those for you there. But when you're doing this, there, there is etiquette. And I thought, I'll talk about the etiquette and what you should and should not do uh, as you launch on these mass email marketing things. So um, as we go through, the first one that you wanna do, I call them the golden rules of email marketing. Uh, don't send emails to people who aren't expecting them. Um, and that's not just a nice rule, that's a law. If you're doing these mass email things now, if they haven't, opted in, you can't send to them. So when you're talking with clubs and things like that, and the other thing is don't buy lists. And for our purposes, I don't know whether we would, but don't buy lists. That's a very quick way to get marked as spam and, and have your emails shut down. So you don't want to buy lists. Um, and, and don't send emails to people who aren't expecting them. Because that, that's, that's the quickest way to turn somebody off. 
You've all received those emails, right? And when you have your database, well, and, and how do you get them to opt in? When you talk to them, uh, if you have a website, um, another producer, and I'm just not gonna name names, but another producer, very smart, because when you go to their website, the first thing that comes up is a little pop-up window. It says, to sign up for my emails and marketing notices, put your email and name right here, and that automatically put it on his list. So make it easy for people to opt in if you want them to opt in. If, if you need them to do that, make it easy for them to do that. And once you have that database uh, collected, you wanna keep it clean and organized. And what do I mean by that? Um, if somebody opts out, we'll talk about that in just a minute, but in our world, we do have some elderly people and if someone passes away, there's nothing worse than their spouse getting an email that you're trying to sell them something. So I know I try to take notice of those things, and the first thing I do is go to my database, and can we sh shut that door, maybe? Or is it coming through here? Okay. It comes through the wall, too. It comes through the wall, too? That's all right. So, but you just don't want to, you just, you don't want to send, email to someone who's no longer with us and then have their already grieving family deal with that. That doesn't make you look good. So be proactive about that sort of thing. Um, when you get those, uh, we'll talk about bounces and things in just a minute. How many of you are, I just by show of hands, how many of you are already using some sort of email marketing through MailChimp or one of these other providers? So most of you are not. No, that's right. Okay, but you, you have used it, just not for square dancing. Okay. All right, the other thing is treat your, treat your users as customers. They're not just email addresses, okay? And hopefully, when you're sending these out, you at least know of them, right? Or it's somebody that you want in your circle. Um, when you send out an email, most of them will have a reply to. The ones I hate the worst are the ones that come from a do not reply address. Those are the first ones I delete. Make sure it's easy for them to reply to you. It comes from a real person, it doesn't come from a robot. You can make it look like it's coming from you personally and you can address them personally. So treat them as people personally, not as just another name that you're trying to sell something to. And then along with that, always identify yourself very clearly. And uh, you, can, you can do that depending on what it is you're sending it out for. You can identify your club, your, your, yourself as a caller, your business, if you've got a logo, you can use that. You wanna be very careful about too many graphics because too many graphics trigger, trigger the spam bots. Uh, you put too much of the wrong things and, and that goes to their spam email automatically. Those, those, and that's the last thing you want, right? You want them to get your email and not automatically have it sitting in a spam folder. People who conceal themselves are what spam trackers are looking for and um, they'll block your ISP, which is definitely what you do not want. Um, and then it mentions here, the, the provider that you're using will help you. There are all kinds of tools that they will provide for you to help you to make your mailings look and feel right. Uh, this monitor the results of your campaigns continuously. Um, by campaign, they're talking about an email. When you send out an email, that's, that's referring to an email. And, and by that, and I'll show you to in just a minute when I put this back in, but when you use, the reason you would wanna use one of these things versus just send a group email because how many of you just send group emails? You've got your mailing lists in Google or Yahoo or whatever, okay? The beauty of these is it will track who's opening them. You know how many people of the 100 you sent it to opened that email. You'll know, did they click on the link that you put in the email? And, and there are metrics that will tell you whether though that was a good campaign or that wasn't. And if people didn't open it, then you gotta figure out what did I do wrong that didn't interest them what didn't intrigue them enough to even open the email, right? And that's what it's saying, analyze the behavior of your database and adapt your strategy. Because if they're not opening it, then you gotta ask yourself why. 
and maybe talk to others who are having success. You've done a lot of this, Bob, yes? So yep. start asking around with other people you know who are doing similar things. Like Eric Hennerlaw in the last session I did with him said he does a lot of this. So ask callers what they're doing and how it's working and you know, look for the experts. <laughs> oh, this is, they're doing the sneak a peek. Oh, is that what it so is? So we're going to have music going on the whole time. Uh, okay. So we get two sessions at once. <laughs> <laughs> I like that tune. <laughs> you get two sessions at once, but not, uh, the, most of the microphone picks it up, the tape won't get it. Can we email them to quiet down? Let's <laughs> 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 email them to quiet down, yes. All right. All right. So they want you to pay attention to the design of your email. And, and they're, they're, they're saying your visual identity is important in reinforcing what it is you're trying to sell, what it is you're trying to get people to do, where you want them to come and, and join you. Um, and this is, this is the piece I had to look up a little bit, but um, if you use too much HTML code, if you don't have it simple, then it makes it hard um, am I trying to say? It doesn't look right. You want it to look right. I know when I'm at work, if I do something that has a, an emoji or something, then it will even give me a warning that says, this may not look right if they're not using HTML. Switch to HTML or, or whatever. Well, at work I have that option, but your users may not. So you may want to be very careful about how much imaging and icons and, and things you put into that email. <laughs> We're just getting serenaded. <laughs> and you do want to balance images and text. You want it to be visually pleasing. Don't make it tiny, tiny fonts that they can't read. Um, and we're going to get down to this just uh, a minute. So innovate, surprise, and try not to bore them. If all you do is just send the same email over and over, they may have opened it the first time. By number 10, are they going to open it? They're going to say, no, I've seen this already. It looks exactly the same. Change your subject line. Um, make it something that says, you know, some buzzword that's going to interest, pique their interest in some way. Uh, in, in my business, if I'm having a sale, I lead with that. You know, such and such, new release and Black Friday sale. Something that's going to say, well, that might be interesting to look at versus, you know, Oh, it's just another email from that person. If by any chance you, you send emails to the wrong place, um, own it. I, I, there was one company that I sent them out, and then they had to send an email back to those same people to apologize for sending to the wrong email. Have you ever sent a text to the wrong person by mistake? Hopefully it's not the wrong person that you were just talking about, you know, but you want to be very, very <laughs> careful when you're sending these things out that it's going to the right person. And the last one of the golden rules, I'm speaking fast, I want to give him time. The last of the golden rules uh, these days, you've got to think mobile. Why? Everybody uses their phone. Everybody uses their phone. I have this in my hand all day long. And anytime I get an email, and I'm looking at it on the phone. And if there's something that's interesting me, I'm trying to click it. And if it doesn't take you to something that you can actually see and turn sideways and make bigger, make sure that you're testing it. There's always, you, know, you can send it to yourself first. There's test emails and see how it looks. Don't just see how it looks on your computer when it comes through. See how it looks on your phone. Check it there too. Uh, so you've got to think, uh, you've got to think mobile. And then um, the last one is work with a reliable, um, we're going to call it a technological partner. Uh, MailChimp is a very popular one. Why they hated me, I don't know. But <laughs> I like more I like chimps. I think they're very cute, but they didn't like me. Uh, so I used a different one that at the time when I was searching, mine is called ReachMail.net. And you know, most of them are going to all do the same things. It's just what works for you, what user interface feels comfortable for you. Um, so real quick, going through the other best practices, these are all, you can read these, but I'm going to, uh, how many of you have ever sent anything out about proofreading? Has anybody ever been sorry? 
I will not tell you over the mic what happened the one time I didn't proofread, because it wasn't nice. <laughs> I was sorry, especially to who it went to. I was very sorry. It was funny, but it was. So you want to proofread. And if you yourself are not an expert in English and written word and apostrophes and commas and where they all go and whether you use you are, you know, you apostrophe re or your y-o-u-r, those are the things some of your customers are and the first thing they look at is go, well, they don't even know how to write. If you say your instead of your, you know. So if that's not your area of expertise, get someone whose it is. You've all got that grammar police friend. Who, who will help you write those things. So if you're not sure, uh, have them have them proofread for you. Um, test all the content before you hit send. Um, sometimes if there's a link or something, you wanna make sure that the link you put in there really works. Uh, a lot of your providers will check those links for you. Because that's part of the email process before you hit the send button and it actually goes out to your list. It checks the links and it tells you it came up quickly. It didn't respond. You know, it will check those things for you. Depending on whether you want to pay for extra things, it will do extra things for you. The one I use is free for the amount that I use it. Um, it said avoid spam trigger words. And so then I went and Googled, well, what is a spam trigger word, <laughs> right? And it said, it's any word or phrase that will send your email to a spam folder. <laughs> That's really descriptive. <laughs> so then I, I dug out, I dug different, deeper. Why are you on the way? Okay. Uh, so here's what they say. This is just a list, but it's not the whole list. Anything that's over-sensationalizing, sounds like it's over-promising. Uh, using strange format to make your email stand out. Well, you don't want it to stand out so much that a spam bot says this is definitely something we don't want going through. And I guess you, sometimes we just learn uh, as we go. Um, if, if when you send these things out that you get more hard bounces um, or, or soft bounces or opt-outs. You know? Or if suddenly you had an open rate of 33% and now your last one went out and it went to five, what happened? It must have gone to spam because people weren't open it. So you've got to start analyzing, like I said before, what went wrong in, in that campaign slash email. Mm -hmm. Is this helping you too, Bob? Is this the kind of stuff that you were looking for? Yep, absolutely. <laughs> and we'll talk about how MailChimp helps. Okay, yeah. Um, include a personal greeting. In your mail list that you create, there are fields for first name, last name, whatever, and you can create those merge lists that if you ever did Word documents or things where you would merge a list of names with a document and it would do it multiple times. You can make that look like you're sending it directly to them with the provider helping you to do that. So do it, take advantage of that uh, tool. Include, like I said before, include a reply to that's a real person. Don't ever send anything out to do not reply. That's the fastest way to, to have somebody opt out of what you're sending them. Uh, and then make it easy to unsus unsubscribe. Because at the end of the day, if they don't want to hear from you, that's their choice. And when they unsubscribe, honor that. Uh, the one that I use, if they unsubscribe, I can't put them back in with that same email. My system knows. And it's like, nice try. <laughs> but, you know... If they unsubscribe, then you just got to think, what did I do? Did I do something that was too much? Or maybe they aren't calling anymore. Or, you know, there may be, who knows what. But you've got to honor that when that happens. Um, know your audience. Depending on who you're targeting in that email, you don't want to be too casual or too formal. Um, you want to watch your language. Um, certain slangs. Uh, Coming into the next one, it kind of go, comes into this watch your tone. We all know from email conversations or online conversations or Facebook group comments back and forth, you can say something personally and the tone of your voice and the look on your face and your body language lets them know whether you're being sarcastic or when you're, they're not. But when they just read it without any of that, 
they may not have any idea. So make sure that what you're sending is very, that your intent and your tone is very clear. And it even says you can use a well-placed emoji from time to time, but you don't want to overuse it because then you've got to worry about those spam triggers and things again. And again, make sure you're using the right emoji. <laughs> you know, I don't know my eyes, I'm like, what is that? Or my glasses. Um, and then personally, use these emails to inform, use them wisely. Uh, surprise them, but the, the quickest way to get me to unsubscribe is to send me too many. So make sure you send them when you really have something important to say. And the more they start opening, you'll realize that what you're saying does have value to them. And you'll see the, the, the rates going up and down and whether that went well or not. Um, I work in marketing at my real job, but I had just come into marketing from finance. And so I had never been exposed to these email campaigns. And so I went and asked them, you know, as I started these for my side business, I had a lot of support from my bosses there, but I told them, what is a good open rate? When you send out an email to 1,000 or 10,000 people, what's a good open rate? And at that time, it was like 10 to 15% and it was a good open rate. That's how many people ignore uh, those things. And so I was thrilled that I was getting 33, 35, and they're like, oh yeah, I'd be happy with that. But somebody else just told me that theirs was at 80%. I'm like, whatever you're doing, keep doing it. You know. All right, do we have any questions yet? No. Okay. All right, then I'm going to plug in. I'm going to switch over. Just so I, I'm just going to give you a quick overview of mine. Um, this reach mail. You get to see the inside of the business. That's really chic. That's very chic. Thank you. Hit the button on the top of the projector and to sleep. Had the, the lighted one. It decided. It was snoozing. It take a, took a break. Do I need to hit it longer? No. Nope. Oh, I hear it. You hear it? I hear it firing up. Absolutely. Give it a chance. Huh? It, it's coming. <laughs> it's coming. Warm it up. So, can you see it yet? Yes. Okay, so this is just my dashboard, and they, they will have all kinds of news and tools, things that you can learn, you know, at least mine does, and I'm sure MailChimp and the others, you know, they keep growing and learning, and they'll, they'll teach you as you go. But you can see over here on the side that, you know, I've got a basic free account, so I'm not paying for this use, they're helping me for free. Uh, probably hoping I'll tell you about it. Yeah. Um, and and it tells me I can send 900 I can send 7,500 emails a month. If I wanted to send more than that a month, then I would need to get a not free account. But for my business, my mailing list is not that big, so this is this is perfect for me. And my list right now of callers is 952. I could have a list of up to 2,500 with this free account. So if you need more than 7,500 emails a month or 2,500 in your mailing list, then you'll have to be looking at other options or other providers. Or paying more. Or paying more, right. Or pay. Or pay, right. <laughs> These rates are cheap. The rates are cheap? I'm looking at the table right now. Yeah, it's not expensive, but I don't need to pay for because this is this free one is working perfectly for what I'm doing. Yeah. So yeah. So you can just see this is my dashboard, and it's saying I sent two campaigns recently, and one of them they, they counted my test campaign because I every time I send one out, I send a test to myself and my husband first, and that's always. Well, I'd say it's always got 100%. Sometimes it's 50 because he doesn't open it. <laughs> like, you're wrecking my static, you know, my statistics. But anyway, we'll say how many I sent, whether that's up or down from a previous month. And, you know, even if it's down just a little bit, um, like I said, I'm weeding that down as I hear people have, have passed or retired from calling or whatever. Uh, delivery rate of all the people I sent it to, it got through to 90% of them. 
If it didn't get through, it either had a soft bounce, which means it just it went to a spam folder or something that kept them from seeing it easily. A hard bounce means you've got a bad email address. They changed it, it's get down, it's gone. And having a hard bounce, at least in my system, it'll tell you about it and you can click on things to, for it to tell you who it is, but I have to go take them out of my database. That's a manual thing I have to do. If they opt out, then I can't put them back and it doesn't send them to, to them anymore. But if you've got a hard bounce, it, it may try to send it, but it's just gonna bounce every time unless somehow that email comes back to life. But it tells me my open rate, the click rate, how many, because in the email you might want things you want them to click on, look at your website or listen to a music sample or whatever. Opening is only half the battle. Getting them to look at your website or whatever it is you're trying to sell is the second half of the battle. And it just will tell you all these things about what it's doing. Back up. And then there's a place where you manage your lists. Uh, this tracks the mailings back to the first time I sent one. And you know, of all the, come on, there we go. Your, your lists are your, are your emails? Yeah, the list, the list is my list of people who have opted in, opted in, who I'm gonna send that to. And you can have multiple lists. Um, you can segment your list. Uh, in my business, sometimes it's helpful to me to know whether uh, the, the, first, the, the caller it has a female range voice or a male range voice because I might market to them differently. So you can segment, you know, this person is a dancer, this one, this one does squares, this one does rounds, this one does contra, this one does all those. You can segment them in different ways and then you can send to only a subset of your group very easily if you segment your market, uh, your list. Or dancing. Music playing in the back. So the, I'm not going to take you through all the different emails I've sent out, but if you want to, you can actually duplicate an email, give it another name, and, and keep a similar format. But as I said, if you just make it look the same every time, they might get bored with it. Find some way to surprise them. And I'll be honest with you, there's all kinds of tools over here that I've never used because I haven't needed them. I sometimes look at the reports that go into more detail than the dashboard does. How many bounced, why they bounced, you know, those things. And then this will hook you into social media if you want, and it, it will post to your Facebook account that an email went out. Um, you can hook it in multiple ways. So I don't have a whole lot else to talk about here. Is there any questions at this point before I turn it back to Bob? Okay. Did uh, did lunch put you all to sleep? <laughs> all right. Well, we switch ends of the table. You all stand up, turn around twice, and, and then so you can sit back down. We're all gonna just exercise a little. <laughs> We're not on the mic. Let's just wake up. <laughs> And let's, let's just take a list of how many, why the chimps don't like me. What are, what are the reasons the chimps don't like me? I don't know. I tried MailChimp and didn't, only delivered 40% of my emails. Mine went all the way through, and then when I went to send it, it wouldn't send. And then it would come back and say I had been blocked for something. And when I tried to go through, it said you signed up before. I'm like, but I never signed up before. And I tried to call them 100 times, and they just ignored. And then they had the gall to send me an email. We noticed you tried to log in, and you stopped. <laughs> <laughs> Don't do that to your customers, because I left the chimps. They're related to Alexa, I think. They're related to Alexa. Uh, yeah, yeah. Sure. You didn't give them any peanuts. I didn't give them peanuts. Bananas. Yeah, bananas. All right, so we'll stop. Talking. But Mailchimp is working great for a lot of people I know. So I just. So with that, I, I will uh, start by saying a couple things. My handout is on the portal. Um, I sent it in. It didn't arrive, and uh, therefore it didn't get printed or put on the portal until this morning. So if you go out to the portal, but this is this is there's a two-page handout. Um, let me just chime in, chime in real quick. This handout that you have here will also be on the portal. I'll be getting that to Teresa later today. So that will be there too. So I want to say, first of all, that ReachMail and MailChimp are not that different. 
They're not that different in the context that they provide you a means to come up with. In the case of MailChimp, it's called an audience. An audience is your emails. And you can record as much information about each individual within in, in, in that audience that, that you want. And it can be addresses, it can be miscellaneous information, it can be names of the partners that go along with the callers, it can be an entire contact ba database, so to speak. Um, so an audience is the first thing um, that you end up identifying. A campaign, she spoke of campaigns. A campaign is an email or an email set. And in the terms of an email set, I will say, I'm holding a dance next Thursday, or I'm actually, I'm gonna show you one. I'm holding a, a dance next Saturday called the No Square Square Dance. About once a year, I hold a dance that has, we dance all night, basically a program, but we never are in four couple squares. And people come to just find out what the heck that means. You know, it's that yeah. little thing that's different. I hold a, a dances on Mondays, Tuesdays, Wednesdays, Thursdays of every week. This week they went out with, we are not dancing, we're dark, we'll be back next week. And I send emails to the entire attendee list and a bunch of others that might come that I have within a tag set. I have about 350 people in my overall dance audience, combination of callers, dancers, prospects, a variety of things. Shauna said, these, all of these people are people who have said they're interested in what I have to offer. I don't necessarily do it through my website, even though I keep thinking, well, I ought to put a, a link in there and do it on the website. I haven't either. <laughs> um, and, and I would do that mostly in the area where um, my website is, is managed in a way that there's a learn section. There's a, there's a page in there associated with learning how to square dance. And I would put the ability to, to subscribe to that part of my mailing list if I would spend a little time setting that up so that I could have the, the web host put that in there. So the, the thing about this is, is these two approaches are, you know, when we get into MailChimp, you're gonna see that the options are very much the same. Every email that MailChimp puts in must have a footer that includes an unsubscribe. And it must have and an address on where to find me. Regional is the same. In fact, I don't have to put it in. They put it in. Ab you know, absolutely. It's, it's, a, it's a piece that's automatically put in at the end of the email. That's really important because if you happen to put somebody in there that, you know, I've, I've got people that I put in the prospect list, and I can keep my prospect list for a long time, and sooner or later, they thought they were interested in square dancing and now they're no longer. So I want them to have the ability to unsubscribe, get off my list. Now, funny thing is, is I have people that don't really want to receive this email, so they unsubscribe from the, when they unsubscribe, they're gone. It says unsubscribe, and I cannot put them in. Now I can send them an email that says, are you sure? And if they reply to it, it will add them back in, but I can't add them back in. And that's the same thing as Shauna was referring to. Right, out. as I said, when they, when they opt out, you can't opt them back in, but they can opt themselves back in. Right. Yeah. And that's an important characteristic about all of this, because this comes back to the etiquette, comes back to what you're doing with this. Um, so what do I use it for? I am, I'm, promoting square dancing to prospects. I'm promoting to various subgroups of the dance community in my area, my dances. And I may, I have a group that goes to the advanced dancers in our area. I have a group that goes to my, my weekly dance by definition session. And they go, it goes out. 
I have a group that goes to my one of my clubs. And I have audiences, the audiences, there's one list of contacts, but they're divided into segments or they're tagged. MailChimp has the ability to tag a dancer as being interested in this or this or this. For example, we, we have DVD Plus on Monday, so I've got them that tagged for that. They, they are participating in the current round dance class that I have on Wednesdays, so they're tagged for that. And they're a member of my Saturday night group, so they're tagged for that. So I can put those three tags on a, on a single contact. And that allows me to say, well, I'm, if I'm sending to the round dance group, I can send it to the 12 people that are in that group. With, and that's really, really powerful. And if it's like reach mail, those tags aren't in there already, but in your database, in your list, you can create anything you want to hit that checkbox. So anything you want to track or, or segment by, you have lots of freedom to create it yourself. So the way you get to MailChimp is through the MailChimp.com site and you don't download it, it's a subscription service and you can basically subscribe to the free version. ReachMail actually has more contacts and emails per month than MailChimp because MailChimp used to be 2,000 emails, it's now 500. They've reduced. Caller Lab used to use MailChimp, the free version, and they're, they've got a problem that they now have more too many contacts. So Teresa's trying to figure out what to do. <laughs> Maybe we should go with Reach Mail. <laughs> so the point being is here's here's what here's where you go to get there. You basically sign up for the free version. It's 500 uh, email addresses and a thousand emails per month. I have not hit that limit yet in either area. When I have people that are no longer, have unsubscribed, they're not removed, I have to archive them before they reduce in the count. So you actually have to take action to get rid of them. But you can't send anything to them, and it automatically prevents you from doing that. And that's the important thing. The thousand emails a month, I must be getting close because I send out several hundred a week to different groups. Um, so when we get in there, I'm gonna, I'm gonna show you some things about the audience. And when you look, read through this, I'm not gonna re necessarily read through it. The audience is your list of emails. And they're, 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 you basically think of it as one list of which there are segments and of which there are tags as ReachMail also provides its similar capability. The campaign is your emails, and I'm going to get in there and show that. So I'm going to switch over. When you have subscribed to email, and you go in, and you get something like this. Now, this is sort of like the main page, the home of this. And you'll notice I've got an open rate of 75.9% relative to the emails that I'm sending, or the campaigns I'm sending. Um, it's probably who I was talking to. <laughs> <laughs> so, over here on the side, you'll see campaigns and all campaigns. There's a whole bunch of things in here that I don't use. I'm going to show you the things I do use. If you get the paid version, the next version up, there's schedules and calendars, and there's much more ability to do scheduling of these. One of the neat features of this is that dance I talked about next Saturday, I wrote up that email or that campaign two days ago and scheduled it to go out on Thursday. I'm gonna be driving to California and back. And, and that's a really neat feature. I basically plan a week ahead and schedule the things I need to do. Uh, and it's, all, it's the only way I survive. Um, I don't use the automations. I do use the audience, and, and I, I'll, I'll just bring this up. the uh, The audience is a list. This is a list of people. Here's the email addresses. Here's the first names, last names. These are the tags that they're associated with. 
So there's a Patricia Hendricks who is tagged with the Heather Gardner's class. So this is a class. Um, and they're subscribed, and there's a bunch of other things in there. If you go into one of these, and I'll go into Patricia, she's, she, she's been in the class before, and, and I don't know how long they'll stay around this time. They're the one of those people to go in and out, and so on and so forth. But look at all the things that I can put in here. I can put their name, I can put their address, I can put a variety of phone numbers in. I can put in their birthdays and their anniversaries. Um, I can do things like put in their age and their gender. I've never done that. I don't anticipate that I ever will. Um, and then there's the tags that they belong to. Um, and there's also groups. So in this case, this person was also related to a club that was called the Heather Twirlers. And so not only is she in a class tag, but she's in a Heather Twirlers group. And th these things can be used interchangeably. You don't have to use groups at all. Tags came along after I started using it, and they are far more powerful than the groups. So just being aware of that, so if I was to add somebody in here, I just simply go up here and add a subscriber, and it comes up with a list. Now the most important thing, and this won't let you put in anybody that you don't have an email for. So I can, I can put my, myself in here. can't type one-handed <laughs> and I like to spell my own name right and and look at here's where the here's where the address list is here's where the phone numbers are here's where the birthday and the anniversaries is here's a comment section I can say that my partner is Alin um, here are the groups that, the, most of these are clubs that I have names for or from who effectively said that they want to hear from me. Go back to her point. That's very, very important. I have class groups. I have a group that's related to my Pikes Peak location. And these are people who have lived in that area of town that are interested in classes. So I've subsetted all of my addresses into a set associated with that class. Okay? Here's where I can put in the tags. And I end up using the class groups and the club groups less now than I did before. I use tags. And if you look at the tag list, you'll see that that tag list is fairly long. And I've got groups in here like, this is the Denver Area Callers and Cures Association. So the, if I tag this to this, I assume this person is a member of that organization. Uh, I might identify him as a cure. Um, there's a group of people who got together periodically to uh, dance to Eric Kennerlaw's uh, Southwest Plus weekend tapes. And they invited me along to decode what they couldn't figure out. <laughs> so. So that's what these tags are good for. They really allow me to take a subset of people and tag them. Then you have to go in here and look down at the bottom here. It says, this person gave me permission to email them. Back to that first statement that Shauna made. If this person is already in my audience and already in my list, update their profile. If you don't click this and they're already in there, it'll come back and say, uh, you can't do that. So you gotta click that. All right, so this is, this is how you get it added somebody in. Now you can also add in from, a, from an Excel file. You can pull in a whole set of them from an Excel file. All right, so any questions about audience? Can we get a microphone? I got it. Name, etc. please. Bonnie Abramson, California. 
Um, we just completed our state convention and we have all of our registrations on with our email addresses on a spreadsheet. Can that be constituted as an opt-in for me to forward that potential mailing list on to the next year's convention? Officially, no. Okay. If, How would if you your registration included a statement near their email address that you're asking for that said, can this be used for this convention or future conventions, then you probably, then you could. Okay. But see, you have to ask permission. I understand, and, and obviously we did not have that and have that information. Thanks a lot, Wow. Well, <laughs> so, do you think we would get blasted out of the water if we sent one email to those people thanking them for attending the convention if you would like to receive information on next year's and future California conventions, please confirm or please opt in and we set up a new group for them to do that. Do you think we would get in too much trouble if we did that? I, I, I would say because those email addresses were provided for your convention, you can use them for your relative to your convention. Yeah, so you okay. could send a thank you. Okay. And if that thank you included a way for them to opt in to future that I think would also be valid. Okay, do you want me to do that for you boys? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. There's another Jim over here also. Yeah, I just wanted to follow there. Oh, Wait, okay. You could ask each individually if they want to be on the list. By sending the thank you and do you want to be on the list, you're really doing that. Yeah. This is not a misuse of the list or an extended use of the list. This is an ask to opt in. Right. Same subject. Same subject. Stay with it. Is yours the same subject? Same subject or different subject? Different. Okay. Different? Okay. <laughs> Start with Risha. Risha Schlitter, we're all in North Carolina. Um, so you mentioned tags, you mentioned groups, and you say you prefer tags over groups. Why? What's what's the difference and why do you use one of them? Tags are a little easier to maintain because you can go into an individual and drop them off of a, out of a tag. You can add new tags in anytime. Groups are a little more restraining and uh, their tags are the new way to do it I suspect over time that they're going to eliminate the, the groups or the segments within the groups so I think it's more along the lines of keeping up with the mechanism the group is kind of a secondary place where you have to manage where with the tags you've got this person in the same place in one place where you can add all those various tags. If they are in multiple classes, you can add as many of those as you want. So it is... Well, you can add a person to as many groups as you want too, but it's a pain in the neck. But you have to manage that group right. separately. Yeah. yeah. Al. Al. Yeah. So Al Hitkins from Maine. A um, couple questions kind of related. One, when you send to a lot of people, um, is it sending individual emails to each person, and from what address does that email come? Want me to so, answer first? Let me, let me show you. So this is a draft email, okay, to my group, Red Hot Country Plus. Notice it says to, and in this case, there's a first name here that it's going to substitute in out of the mail list. Mm -hmm. From Red Hot Country Plus at Bob at squaredance, etc. com. That's my Square Dance related email address. It can be whatever email address you have, and it's coming from that. You can change it every time. And you can change it to whatever you want, or whatever address you have. So you know who it's coming from. So is it sending from your mail server? No. It's sending from the MailChimp server. And the MailChimp server is managing. The, the spam process, they are less likely to be accused of issuing spam than you are. Right. And so this is the service, both ReachMail and 
MailChimp are providing you the service of the fact that the, the server providers around the country know these entities and know what servers they're coming from and can make sure they stay open. And if they, if they find themselves on a spam list, MailChimp contacts the server and clears it, clears the issue. You don't have to do with it. If you send mail and you get accused of, of spam mail, it'll take you weeks to clear it up. The other thing is when you look at the email, it does look like it came from his email. But the biggest difference is really the little thing at the bottom that says this was sent by such and such right. if you want to opt out. But it will look like it came from him and if you reply to it, it will go to him. But all those other benefits he talked about, it's really not coming from him, it's coming from this other more known server. Uh, one of the reasons I asked that is because we use, this is at Roundel App, we have at Roundel App email addresses. But an at Roundel App email address actually goes to bomb at gmail.com. And I'll still work this thing. The problem is that Gmail now recognizes that that email did not, did not sent from a Gmail account and it automatically spams it to bomb. Yeah, G Gmail has some limitations associated with this, whereas in the case of, of these mail servers, and I will say we're talking about ReachMail and we're talking about MailChimp, but contact, uh, custom, constant, contact. constant contact and all of these others are very much the same in, in the fact that they're a server, they're providing emails from a server, they're showing it's from and it will return to whatever the reply is. But it, it's not like a forward. It's not a forward. Mm -hmm. It's like a bulk mail processor for postal mail. Yeah. It comes from Cleveland, but it has my return address on it if I'm sending it out for my business. But your round the lab address has a forward on it that says forward to your out address. Yeah. Well, it's an alias. It's yeah. an alias. Yeah. Now, okay. my round the lab is not, my forward. round the lab at round the lab is not. Okay. But we have education at round the lab, which goes yeah. to whoever yeah. is the current education coordinator. You want me to run the mic? Yeah. <coughs> so we have email addresses that are aliases. Okay. And the nice thing about the alias is, as we change whoever is supposed to get that email, it's not the responsibility of all of our membership to know who is the current education coordinator. They can just send it to education. So that's a, a nice feature. The problem is, right now, is I've gone through hours and days dealing with our email provider because that email arrives at the person's box as though it's coming from a Gmail address, but it doesn't have the right Gmail header in the invisible stuff. So it says, oh, this looks like it's coming from Gmail, but it's not. Right. And that's been an issue. <coughs> I'm not sure we can solve your no, problem no, you with can't, this. You and, can't. And, and, just, and, I was just asking that. Well, and the only other thing I'll add, as much as these things can help you, they're not gonna keep stuff from sending to spam every time. I mean, sometimes when I test it to myself, it went to spam. It's coming from me to me and the things I spam to myself. So, you gotta look at that and say what, but with those forwards and things, I understand what you're doing, it makes perfect sense. We did the same thing. So, um, so one of the things that I just did here is, there's, there's two ways to test, um, an email and when you when you first go into one of these um, we go through all of this and down here at the bottom there's uh, this preview and I wanted to show you a little bit about so this is what the email looks like and I, I, I pretty much have every email I have says here's the event here's the date here's the time here's who's calling here's the location and there's extra information down here at the bottom I've got future stuff that they can go look at it so that they can add it to their calendars because I want them to do that. And then because we're dancing at the outpost in Denver and there are rules, the rules are down here at the bottom. You don't wear wet shoes into that hall, period. <laughs> you lock your door because it's in of your car. But notice down here at the bottom, our, email, our mailing address is, and right here is the unsubscribe. That's terribly important. This information is required 
by MailChimp and you put it in at the very beginning of your subscription and you don't change this. It just automatically appears at the bottom of every email. So you don't have that, that issue. All right, so Shauna was talking about the content of mail, what you put in there is catchy and so on and so forth. Let me go back here and say, okay, so we've got the to, we've got the from, we've got the subject, and the subject actually comes in two pieces. It comes in a subject that would display in anything, and it comes in a preview text, which will show up in a text-only message, if they happen to be using text-only as their, on their mail server. So that'll show up. So that's what's in there, and then their content is, you can edit the content, and this can be done based on templates. Do you have templates? Okay, it can be done based on templates, so you have the same look and feel all the time. And, and, and I don't use a lot of templates, I use actually, I, I bring things that I've done before and bring them up and then do heavy modification of the first part of it, because that, set of rules at the bottom for, for this group is always the same. And they better have read it once or they're gonna hear from me. But, you know, anyway, so looking at this, there's, within this email, there's the overall header and they can look at that in an instant and know which group it is. Then there's the, what I would call the the invitation. In this case, I say hi all because I want them to know that I'm actually talking to more than one. I might say, hello John. And that's easy enough to do. I can just put in a little substitution text and instantly John's name would show up in there when he received his email and I'm sending one thing to all the people and John and Mary and Sue and so on all get an email that looks like it came to them only. All right, then I, then I always put in, what's the event, what's the date, what's the time, who's the caller? This is how you know who's calling for this particular dance. Somebody, somebody might be coming in to do it. What's the location, the address, right up front. I sometimes put in, I don't always put in the directions, but we have enough variety of people that don't know where we are. We moved at the beginning of 2023, or 2022, and so we're still trying to make sure everybody comes to see us. And then there's a contact, there's a phone number for both Ellen and I down here. Now, I'm still using that. I have a, I have a, uh, a forwarding phone number, which I use a lot of the time, which isn't the one that's on my cell phone. It's a, it's a number to forward to. This came about because of COVID. If you're sick today, come back another day. I don't want to see you. And uh, make sure your shoes are dry, just because of the nature of it. Here's the future dances, here's the notes. All of this is editable, and, come on back here, um, and, and it's the stuff you put in there. Now you build those things using that same editor. You know what time the session's over? Yeah, 15 minutes. Got 15 minutes. 15 minutes. All right, so that's, that's sort of the gist of what's, what you can put into things. Um, I have, within the, in the overall thing, if I say, okay, um, if I go back here, she was showing that the emails that she's already sent, this is the same kind of thing. This is a list. This is searchable. I can put, uh, I can put in here and say all the ones that were So these are all the ones related to Sunflower Squares, which is a club name. So I can basically search any collection of these things. There's about five years of stuff in here, if I, if I go all the way to the bottom, um, that's there. If I'm going out to say, okay, um, Monday was yesterday, so this one really isn't any valid anymore, I can go and edit it. If I'm looking for, um, my 
Tuesday group is Bebop's. That would be meeting tonight. And if I was going to send them an email, I would go over here and I'd say replicate. And I'd go in and then, and, and it comes up with a new name. It gives me a little bit of a name. And I, and I would go in here and I would edit this. And I'd say, okay, this needs to be the 25th. And of course I can't type with one hand and uh, all that kind of stuff. But the point being is, is I can effectively set this up. Now, to Shauna's point, this email will look the same as the last email they got unless I do something. So if I go in here, I'm gonna change the subject. I'm always gonna change the subject. And I may change it a little bit or I may change it a lot, depending well, upon it. And, and in some cases, when you are sending to a specific group and they get it, it might be good in that case if it's a club they're used to going to, or maybe they have two or three, they see that picture and they know which one it is automatically. That might not be something you want to change every time. It's just what your purpose is is going to depend how and right. and how much you want to change these things. So this header over here, you can see there's a bunch of dancers. These are the guys that come. This is these are actually a picture of one of our dancers that we put in here. Um, I'm also using a calendar that Ray had on. Ray manages my site, and he has a calendar on there that allows me to do sign-ups. For the advanced group, I've, it's been very helpful to know who's coming, because I can determine whether I don't ha I have enough to dance or not enough to dance. So that's been very, very helpful. So this sign-up thing is a function of a particular calendar plugin for a website. Um, but then I'm down here into the same thing, I, same kind of information I had on the previous one. And I'm, I actually am using the same hall, so uh, a lot of the information is the same because I, I have a hall for Monday and a hall, the same hall for Tuesday and the same hall for Wednesday. So that kind of thing. So seeing that that's what's out there. Now, this ability to schedule, and if I go back to, yes. Yes, I saved it, and I, I meant to. But if I want to get rid of it, I, I checked it, go over here and put in delete. This is really particular. It wants you to, to spell out delete in order to delete it. So you gotta be sure. That's it's a good nice, thing. It's nice they have checks <laughs> like that when things are going away. But this, so this kind of thing here. So. In each of these cases, I have options. I can view it, I can replicate it, I can go in and look at it. Now, if I'm, if I'm searching in here, I can search for emails, I can search on, on a variety of things. Some of this stuff I don't use. Again, if I wanted to pay money, I would get all these features. So, I've got a question back well, here. I was, gonna move, I was gonna move to questions here. It's Bonnie Abramson again. When you set up these initial accounts, do they have to be in an individual's name? Or does it, like for example, if we want to set up this list for our California State Convention and it rotates around the state, we have different chairmen, can we set up one account? <coughs> Excuse me, and then update the contact, contact information each year, or is that going to require us to create? a whole new account that when Mike and John are then being chairman, the new chairman have to create a whole new account. MailChimp can be set up on an account by basically any name. Okay. So you could say your account is California State's Cal Well, something of that nature. It, it right. needs to look like a name. It could be Joe, California. Yeah, yeah I understand. <laughs> And, and, and it needs a password and, and so that it can log in because it is secure. Yeah. But then once you get in there, the, the email information about who they come from and all of that, and then who gets the emails, that's all changeable. Right. Yeah. So we got so Jim, Jana, and then Jim. So that it can be passed on and carried on. So I, I understand that you can do 500, you can do 2,500 names. 
are you limited to the number of pages that you can send out because I'm looking at this for our council newsletter. So the way MailChimp handles this is you basically would upload a, you, you upload a, a single file with your newsletter on it and you put a link in your email that allows that to be displayed. So it's actually not putting the uh, newsletter in the email, it's actually providing a link to it on the MailChimp server. And so you're not uploading massive amounts of text into that. I've done that with schedules and newsletters and things of that nature. Um, I've done that with, with for, our, for our performance team, I send them the choreography of all of our dances. And so I will send upload a file for dance A, dance B, and dance C. And it's not like a newsletter, but it's similar. And I don't know of a limit on that, Janet. Okay. Bob, if I can add that button can also send out a something like print flyer here. Or yes. You, you label the button and not just the yes. It it basically is a it, it basically is a link to the source with an action. Ray. Uh, Ray Owens for that second. I, I'm sorry, I, really, I wasn't paying attention, Bob. Yes. <laughs> but but it was something I heard a minute ago talk about a limit on the mailings and stuff. You're aware back on March 10th, MailChimp seriously degraded their free tiers. Yes. Did, did you cover that already? I mentioned the fact that we reduced the number of, uh, of, 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 of size of the audience and size of the number yeah, of 500 emails. 500 can be on the list, but there's a limit of only 1,000 emails that you can send a month down from 12,000. Right. So they seriously degraded that. Yes. And the next higher tier that were paid that you can up those limits something like $400 a year now. Yeah. With MailChimp. Mm -hmm. Yes, that is that is the new thing, and it, I, I'm still able to work within it. But, but be aware. Associations and things like this may have a much larger database, and so what I would what I would recommend is go look, Google like I did, look at this list that's on the form, and go see what their tiers are, and because they all work very similar, and you can, that you can get ratings on it. Yes. So, okay. So, uh, Risha. One of, the, one of the things is is that be aware of all of these because they're all finding that they're competing with each other and so they're all trying to, to figure out what how can I make money and provide service. So that's that's sort of the reason why that those restraints. Risha. Uh, it's Risha again. Uh, so if I understand correctly what you're saying is you can set up one account, single password, and from that one account you can have um, several mailing lists like to our advanced group, to our challenge group, to our uh, Hayslots sports group, and each of them can have a different return email address, is that correct? Because that's set up on a campaign by campaign basis. Right. Okay. So the return address can be anything. Now I will say that I have uh, in here, in, in audiences, let me make sure I'm not a liar, I have experienced prospects, Color Lab committee members, and self, and, and Square Dancers. So I actually have four different audiences. I believe that one of that, de de that degrade took me down to one audience, but they're not taking away the audiences I already have, but I, I deleted all the, the people out of an audience and removed the audience, and I can't create a new one. So they're effectively, every, if I get rid of an audience, I will not be able to use it again because I won't be able to add a new one in. That's part of that degrading that Ray was speaking of. So be aware, now I can create as many subgroups within any, any of these, to Risha's point, I can create multiple segments, subgroups, tags, all within a single audience. But with the reduced set, I'm not going to be able to create multiple audiences, which is what you'd like to do in some cases. Pat Zeman, Victoria, British Columbia. Um, I use several different email addresses 
to send to different, am I allowed to designate which email addresses it's coming from? Yes. Okay. Each campaign will allow you, so each email will allow you to choose who you want that to come from. And if you've got several, that's just another thing you want to double check every time you say that it came from the right one. Right. And as we're getting close here, we just have a couple of more minutes. The last thing I want to say is, I didn't know a lot about this. It's amazing what you can find out on Google. So don't be afraid to Google and Google anything. And YouTube will have training videos. I mean, anything you want to find, you can find training on YouTube these days. So if you have questions, if you don't have someone specifically you know can answer it, Google and YouTube are your friends. Search for it and I bet you'll find it. And in both of these cases, we, we touched the surface of these the capabilities of these systems. And, and, and so you go in and play around. Go in and create an audience. Go in and create an email. Go create a campaign that's, that goes to that email. I would highly recommend that you create a campaign that goes to you. <coughs> goes to you and your partner. And then go in and look at the statistics about what you, what you saw and what you did. Um, because you'll, you'll find out a lot about about these things and you look, you look at some of these and you know here's an example so this Heather Heather Gardner square dance class I sent it to or there are 22 opens which was 75.9 percent of the list I sent it to well that's about right because that's a club and a group and it's a fairly close group um, if I sent it to, uh, got a bunch of drafts here, but each one of these has a different subset, different percentage. Notice there's a, there's a click on here as well, which was the same thing Shauna was showing. Number of clicks, the click throughs to it. Virtually all of mine have references to my website and to, in some cases, to a flyer that's buried inside of it. So, we thank them. Yeah, I, I, are there any final questions? Because if not, it's break time. Yeah. Thank you. Right. Well, thank, thank you for you. attending. Hope it was worthwhile.